Hello and welcome to Encore's music show. I'm Mariam Saab, coming up. A huge talent born on the strings of a one-eighth miniature violin in Siberia. Vadim Repin began as a child prodigy and matured into the most perfect violinist, according to the late 20th century violin maestro Yehudi Menuhin. From Beethoven to Brahms, Sibelius to Shostakovich, Vadim Repin has interpreted the greatest violin repertoire set to score. He joins us in the studio ahead of the Trans-Siberian Arts Festival. Vadim Repin, it's a great pleasure. Welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Now, that introduction I just gave could have been remarkably different if you got your first pick of instrument. We could say that you didn't choose the violin, it chose you. That's true. Well, it's been purely by chance. I wanted to do any music, uh, noisy music, the, the louder the better, according to my mother. And uh, at the school, they had only free space uh, on the class of violin. And you wanted to play the accordion initially? Yes, I've learned how to play this when I was three and a half or four, and it was one of my favorite toys. But destiny was calling, and we can see here, this is you at 12 <laughs> years of age, remarkable, playing the violin and alongside your mentor, uh, Zachar Bron. Now we're going to take a look at, uh, at Vadim Repin at various stages in his career. <laughs> Now, Zach Abron, your mentor, really set the wheels in motion when it comes to your career. You've said that having the Russian violinist as your early teacher was enormous luck. What memory stands out that captures the spirit of your time together? Well, you know, he's a very special teacher in a way that he was so young and he was really at the peak of his violinistic um, playing career. And he nevertheless dedicated all his life to teaching. And that's quite remarkably. So at the lessons, there was always chance for him to explain things, which he knew incredibly because he had this talent of digging into how it is made, how the sound produced and why, you know, some people have the sound to, uh, to recognize, somebody don't. And so he would show in the classroom just playing by himself. And I heard he's not as severe as he comes across in the clips that circulate online where he's yes, reprimanding this clip, you. Yes, this is very for famous that right. in, in a way, in between some violinists, famous because he was really killing me. And I don't know what, what bug beat him just an hour before. And he was so strict with me. Never before, never after he was in such a mood. Well, you never know. Now, you've carried on this tradition of nurturing childhood talent uh, into a classical musical festival you founded in your hometown in Siberia. It's called the Trans-Siberian Arts Fe Festival. It begins March 15th and runs through to mid-April. What's your vision for the festival? Well, I see that on one side we call it Trans-Siberian because Trans-Siberian is a bridge between West and East. And I've thought of it for a very long time. I've been asked to do something in, in my hometown, which is Novosibirsk. And by, you know, always getting distant, uh, finally I thought, why not? And to create something unusual, and especially something that never been done before. And in my dreams, I, 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 I envisage this as a global project because this bridge is Trans-Siberian, it's 9,000 kilometers, so we can make it even bigger. And you're even connecting with Japan during this festival. Absolutely, yeah. we do pro interesting programs in Japan uh, and uh, uh, this year we'll be also in Europe and uh, in other places and many cities in Russia. Cultural bridges that you create between people, they're the strongest. You share a life, a family and the stage with prima ballerina Svetlana Zakharova. 
Uh, you'll be performing together again at this year's festival, the Trans-Siberian Arts Festival. Now, does being in total harmony on the stage mean that you've got all the little things worked out, like who's going to cook dinner and who's going to change the light mm -hmm. bulb, take out the trash, just very cliche things like that? Oh, well, you know, it, our life is, is such that when we have a day together, it's like a godsend. So. Practically, I don't remember ever discussing these things. They go naturally. She's, you know, when she doesn't have to perform at night, she's a perfect housewife, as one can say. And at the same time, when she has a performance, of course, everybody is sort of watching nothing. She, she has to perform. And that, I think, the balances things that when I have to perform, she becomes a really a supporter and vice versa. Now, when you have your downtime alone or together, uh, what kind of music do you like to listen to outside of classical music? Uh, well, just about anything. She likes very much to listen to classical radio, and I also like. But when outside, outside, of outside, classical. it could be anything. You know, the the point of radio, I like it very much because uh, there's always surprise. You never know what's what's going to come next. So a little bit of hip hop, a little ah, bit of R&B. Well, a my bit favorites of rock. are. My favorites are, uh, I even had a funny story with uh, rap. Rap? I love rap because music is actually starts with rhythm. And when it is rhythmically interesting, rhythmically unusual, oh, that, that, that kicks me. <laughs> well, that leads us to the new release of the week. It's not rap, but it's Ed Sheeran. His third studio album, Divide, is out this week. It's keeping with the same formula as his two previous records, Plus and Multiply. The 12th song outing pays homage to the British singer and, song singer and songwriter's native Suffolk and his hometown love. Three singles from Divide have scored a rare top three trifecta on the Australian singles charts. And Divide ends a one-year hiatus that saw Sheeran unplug from social media to travel the world and see everything he says he'd missed. And you don't have to come to Paris to enjoy the offerings of Paris Opera's Troisième Sin, an online creative platform hosting remakes of the classics. This month, French rapper Abdel Malik released his take on Verdi's opera Othello, based on Shakespeare's play. Much like a silent movie, Abdel Malik uses titles to disperse dialogue throughout the short film. Now, uh, Vadim, when it comes to modernizing, modernizing the classics, do you think that it's subversive or sacrilegious? Well, I think anything you do is it crossovers or popular things, because it, at some point of time it was pop music. Um, when it is on the highest level, uh, I really enjoy it. I think it's, it's, it's great. And festival is such a great platform to experiment, to do things. Many projects are born in the festivals, because when you have your season running, you come to perform here, you come to perform there, and you don't really meet key persons who could be, you know, your colleagues, who who actually are in the end the motto of new ideas. And so when you have a couple of days or three days together in between the concerts or between rehearsals, and you all meet up and brilliant ideas are born. Now we're going to end on a classic, Vadim Repin. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to keep Such an a ear out Thank you. for the Trans-Siberian Arts Festival coming up in March, uh, mid-March. And you're going to play us out with some Ravel. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, this famous uh, G-string solo, we are in Paris, and it's one of my absolute favorite cities to be, to play, either with concerts or without. And Ravel is one of my heroes of my life of uh, composers. So uh, I think it could be the only choice. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to leave you with Vadim Repin and his hero, Ravel. <laughs>